small was the tagline of one of the famous Volkswagen Beetle ads in the 60s. But let's do it for a moment, because how small can cars get? Quite small by the looks of it. Enter the wonderful world of microcars. Welcome to a tiny 19th episode of the Automotive History series, where we're going to put the microcar under the microscope. Uh, first, a little message from me. Uh, my apologies if my voice sounds a bit different than usual. After one and a half years, I finally caught the good old Corona. If you're watching this in the year 2071, this was a real thing 50 years ago. Look it up. Before we even start looking at the history, I'm going to take a micro moment to discuss the definition of a microcar. Microcars are defined as a very compact, small engine car designed for use in large cities, especially in Japan. So it's just a matter of size, right? Well, size is just a matter of perspective, which I always tend to say to my Tinder dates, but it also counts for this video. For example, let's compare these two. A Messerschmitt, which, for the sake of argument, is defined as a microcar, and a Fiat 500, a car by some regarded as a microcar, but usually seen as a city car, a step above a microcar. Now look at their dimensions. The Fiat is only 10 centimeters longer in length and is considered a quote-unquote real car. The lines are blurry. There are plenty of parameters you can use to determine if a car is a microcar or not. Vehicle size, vehicle weight, engine size or power output. And every country all over the world uses one or more of these parameters to set up rules and regulations. Generally, you don't need a driver's license to write one of these, and they usually have their own insurance and tax rates, as well as specific road rules. But this all really depends on your country's way of treating them. Because aren't microcars not just two motorcycles glued together with an enclosed body? You tell me. Let me know in the comments what you think. Is a microcar more closely related to bicycles, mopeds, motorcycles, or is it more closely related to a normal car? And if you haven't completely dropped out of this video yet from my incoherent rambling, then what about terms like bubble cars, cycle cars, and quadricycles? Let's dive into the history. Microcars are almost as old as normal cars. In fact, the first microcars weren't known as such, as they were known as cycle cars. See, in the early days, many normal-sized cars were still a novelty and a toy for the rich. They weren't that practical, so you only took them for a Sunday drive around your massive estate to impress your guests. But what if you were an everyday workman that just simply needed to go somewhere every day that you in no way could do on foot or by bike? Well, that's where the cycle car was for. The earliest cycle cars were nothing more than a glorified quadricycle. Other than the bare necessities used to make it move, not much else was on it. The market for these cycle cars started to slowly emerge in the early 1900s and by 1912 an international convention took place to determine the definition and classify cycle cars. The convention also threw some tax reduction into the mix and that was a good move. The cycle car market exploded in the 1910s and cycle car shows and magazines came along with it. In 1911 you only had a choice of a couple cycle car makers, three years later it were more than a hundred. But by the 1920s, the cycle car market faded with the rise of low-cost full-size passenger cars like the Ford Model T in the USA and the Austin 7 in Britain. I, I, I say full-size, but you know what I mean, like the real deal. As soon as the Depression era was over, the need for very small and affordable cars waned. But not for long! <laughs> The Second World War had a huge effect on car ownership. Cars in occupied Europe became almost useless as there was a constant gas shortage. Plus, there were people that lost almost all of their belongings. Your part of the world might not have been destroyed by the war, but I know my part of the world has. After the war, some countries quickly switched back to normal, but much of Western Europe first had to rebuild a thing or two before they could start thinking about buying an expensive car. To once again fill the gap, especially for people that just had to go from A to B and were unable to walk or bike the distance, the microcar was their solution. 
Not only that, microcars were also a great way to cheat the system in Europe. They came in handy as a small, fuel-efficient and rather cheap way of transportation, especially during times like the 1956 Suez Crisis. And as we know from American cars, space and jet age design was popular in the 50s, but it also found its way into microcars. The first microcar to arrive was the Bond minicar in 1949. After that, the microcar market boomed once again. Arguably the most well-known microcar is the BMW Isetta, but it should be noted that BMW built this under license. You're actually looking at an ISO Isetta. An ISO is an Italian car and motorcycle manufacturer. But there is so much more to show you. Like the Fulda Mobile, the car that started the bubble car nickname. The Messerschmitt is a great example of futuristic styling. Please take a seat in the airplane cockpit type of interior. The Spatz microcar is a microcar with a touch of convertible flair and an excellent fuel-efficient boulevard cruiser. Then you have the Frisky Family 3, but I don't see myself getting frisky on a first date in a car like this. The Peel P50 holds the Guinness World Record as the smallest production car ever made. And I'm gonna end with this, the Zundap Janus, a car where the front and rear are the passenger doors and people are sitting back to back. The name fitted the car as Janus is the two-faced Roman god. <laughs> this car would really fit my personality. And the thing is, many of these cars weren't made by your average car maker. Instead, there were plenty of motorcycle and moped manufacturers that thought, oh, we can make money from this. But around the start of the 60s, three things happened. First, the middle class was moving up market in Europe and families could finally afford luxury products like televisions, refrigerators and actual passenger cars. Second, around this time you saw the rise of the people's cars, more on that in a moment. And third, some countries wanted to stimulate the purchase of passenger cars, so taxes were lowered to microcar level. This meant, in some cases, that microcars were even more expensive than standard passenger cars. All these things really didn't work out in favor for microcars. Heinkel cabines were traded in for Volkswagen Beetles, Iso Iseras were traded in for Fiat 500s, Rovan D4s were traded in for Citroën De Chevaux, and the Frisky Family 3s were traded in for Austin Minis. And so, microcars were back to square one. In the 60s, they were more like a novelty item than something useful, and it wasn't until the 70s before they started to gather some public interest again. Because in the 70s, you had the oil crisis of 73 and the energy crisis of 79 that led to an increase in gas prices. And the whole idea of a super fuel-efficient car became attractive again. And for the first time, electric drivetrains were applied to these new microcars. Like this Microdot or Minissima, a hybrid microcar concept that can only be entered through the rear, and the Vanguard city car. The city car was given a longer life and some 2300 were produced, making the company the sixth largest manufacturer of cars in the United States. By the 1990s, microcars suffered from their quirky image. I mean, let's face it, if you don't have to, you don't want to be seen in one of these things, right? But microcars gained another purpose. They were a perfect fit for those that were unable or not willing to drive a normal car. The disabled and the elderly. Ever since Grandpa died, Grandma can't really handle the Volkswagen Golf anymore, so we gave Granny a Kanta, a Dutch microcar, instead. And look how happy she is! <laughs> Still, don't you think it's time for another revival of the microcar? Welcome to the 2020s. I'm going to make a little prediction here. I think the microcar is making another comeback in the coming years. Don't believe me? Especially in Europe, all kinds of ride-sharing services are popping up that provides low-cost mobility by using electric microcars. With the touch of a button, you can unlock one of these babies and off you go. Also, food delivery services make use of microcars. A snack joint near me uses Renault Twizzies for food delivery. You have to understand that the youth of today, me somewhat included, thinks differently about cars and mobility than the parents. Cars are no longer a possession or a gateway to freedom. Cars are just another mode of transportation, interchangeable with taxis, trains, buses and trams. And if this thing offers me easy and emission-free transportation, then who am I to turn it down? 
And it's the electric drivetrain that makes these cars interesting again. Citroën released the fully electric Citroën Army not long ago. The Microlino is an electric retrofuturistic Isetta. And Messerschmitt is working on an electrified reintroduction of the KR. And the best selling electric vehicle in China is the Wuling Hongguang Mini EV. A car that became an instant hit due to its very low price, making electric driving available to everyone. Alright, let's uh, wrap this up. I am well aware that I not even once mentioned the key cars or K cars of Japan. The thing is, I'm going to keep that for another episode. Otherwise, this episode is getting way too long or, uh, you know, too big. <laughs>